Hello. Good morning everyone. Good morning in Indonesian time. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad to be here as the moderator of the lecture will be given uh, by Dr. Luki Puspitarini. Dr. Luki Puspitarini is the uh, permanent staff in at the Department of Astronomy Institute Technology Bandung and a re, a Astronomy Research Division uh, here. She got her bachelor degree in ITB, uh, Department of Astronomy, and master degree from Université Paris Diderot, and doctor degree from Observatoire de Paris. Uh, her research interest is asteroid, planetary atmosphere, interstellar matter, and galaxies. Now uh, she will uh, present uh, her lecture introducing us on uh, diffuse matter in space. So let's let us uh, here listen to her lecture. Dr. Puspitarini, uh, the time is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kunjaya. Uh, can you hear my voice? Clearly? Is it clear, my voice? Yes, clearly. Yes. Okay. okay. Good. So I will share my screen. Uh, can you see the screen? Yeah. Okay. Okay, okay I, will, uh, I will start now. Thank you very much. So good morning, everyone. Um, uh, how are you? I hope you are uh, well and healthy despite this uh, pandemic uh, situation. Um, so uh, I'm so happy that we can meet again. Uh, we meet in uh, Monday and now um, I will talk about uh, diffuse matter in the universe. Um, so actually this is a bit out of topic from the dark matter, um, but uh, diffuse matter is uh, actually important uh, to understand the visible uh, universe that we, study, uh, we see now. Okay, before starting, um, as we know that the summer school is organized by ITB or Institute Technology Bandung. So, uh, now you are uh, from all over the world, uh, but I will uh, show you a little bit about Bandung. <laughs> so Bandung city is in Indonesia. So the city is surrounded by mountain. You can find tea, plantation, monumental building, and also the traffic jam. <laughs> and ITB, uh, our institution, is located in Bandung. So this is ITB and astronomy department uh, is in this building in the top floor, the highest floor. And this is all the stuff uh, from, sorry, I haven't shared my laser pointer. So this is all the lecturer stuff. Uh, and uh, beside the site in ITB, we also have uh, Bosca Observatory, which is a very historical and very iconic uh, uh, in Bandung. So from ITB, let's, uh, I will take you to the space. Well, it's not working. Sorry. Okay. So if we see the sky, uh, we are not only seeing stars. So there's many stars, but we also see diffuse matter. So what is in your mind when I say diffuse matter? So maybe some of you think about clouds or interstellar matter. Yeah, and that is correct. So uh, diffuse matter, uh, one of them is interstellar matter. But actually diffuse matter in the universe has really broad definition. Uh, sorry, I 
Oops, what happened with my moist pointer? Oh, okay, uh, so here I show you a plot uh, from Dopita and Sutherland. Uh, this is very interesting book, Diffuse Matter in the Universe. Uh, this is log of uh, uh, N uh, density, and this is the temperature. And you can see all type of diffuse, diffuse matter uh, in the universe. So not only we have interstellar matter, here you have molecular cloud, uh, H1 region, H2 region, uh, but you also see um, galaxy like AGN, uh, also uh, intergalactic medium and uh, you see here the density of diffuse matter is very low so here you have this dash uh, line and so this uh, is the boundary between the local thermodynamical um, equilibrium and the non-local uh, uh, thermal equilibrium. So most of the diffuse matter is non-LTE uh, condition. So in this uh, lecture, in this session, um, I will not talk about all of them, uh, but we will discuss more about interstellar matter in the galaxy and a little bit about intergalactic matter. So you uh, probably already see this uh, picture a lot <laughs> during this summer school. So this is the relative contribution of baryon, dark metal, dark energy to the mass energy density of the current universe. So we see that most of uh, the, the biggest contribution is from dark energy. And then we also have dark matter. And we also have the baryonic matter the visible universe that we see is actually less than 5%. So the ISM is actually in here. So if we now zoom this 4.8%, oh, oh, sorry. So we have this uh, distribution. So this is approximate division of uh, the baryonic mass density of the current universe. So stars, uh, contribute about 7% of the baryonic mass um, that we see. Uh, and ISM, interstellar matter, is only 1%, as you can see in this green. Uh, whereas we have also uh, CGM, uh, is this uh, circumgalactic matter, so about 5% and intracluster matter 4%, and then diffuse intergalactic matter about 40%, and then uh, warm hot intergalactic matter about 43%. So you see that interstellar matter is um, very small in here, like only 1%. But we will see that despite this only 1%, it has important role uh, because it will build our, um, our visible universe, like stars, galaxies. Okay, okay. Um, I don't know what happened. If I enter, it doesn't go to the next slide. I will, um, okay, I will stop first the sharing screen. There's a technical problem in my laptop. Okay, now I will go again to the Zoom. Sorry for this technical problem. Okay. Okay. Ah, now nah, nah, it's good. Okay, so uh, we'll come back again to this uh, pie diagram. So you see here the contribution um, for each component in this baryonic mass. So you see that the, the sky or the space between star is not empty. 
So there's uh, interstellar matter. Interstellar matter, by definition, is everything between stars in the galaxy. Um, so we will mainly talk about gas and dust. So the gas and dust is um, well mixed. So we often uh, uh, say that it is as interstellar clouds. This is one of the examples, this horsehead nebula. So this is a mixture between gas and dust. Um, so by broader definition, we're not only having gas and dust, but with the broader definition of ISM, we also have magnetic field, cosmic ray, and radiation field that also present uh, in the space uh, between the stars. So where does this ISM come from? So we know that uh, it is uh, some primordial material. So it comes just after Big Bang, uh, but it's also uh, mostly recycled material from the stars. You see this illustration in here that uh, the stars are born in ISM and then after it dies, um, after the, the uh, in the end of the evolution of the star, it will return to the ISM. So why we learn ISM? There are several motivations to study interstellar matter. The first is that it plays a fundamental role in the galaxy. It is responsible for the stellar formation and also evolution of the galaxy. As we already see the plot here, so here we see that new stars are born from ISM and it will become stars and during uh, its life, the star will expel, will, will expel uh, a little portion of uh, its material into the, ISS, uh, into the ISSM uh, through solar wind and um, in the end of its evolution, it will expel large portion uh, of uh, its envelope to the ISM. So this is the evolution for the low mass star, and then this is for the massive star, and we see the star will come back again to the ISM. But as we know that heavier element uh, which are cooked via nuclear fusion, uh, fusion in cell interior, it will enrich uh, the ISM. So this is, uh, in this cycle, we will have uh, enrichment uh, of the ISM. So more and more we will uh, see uh, more complex uh, molecule and more complex uh, element. So with this cycle, we see that there will be a chemical evolution um, uh, that will change our galaxy. So ISM is important not only star for, uh, for the star formation, but also the evolution of the galaxy. And uh, ISM is uh, of profound importance in describing the structure, dynamics, and evolution of our galaxy, as well as other galaxies throughout the universe. And the other motivation is also related to the interstellar reddening and extinction. Uh, so uh, ISM affect our uh, observation. So that's why it is uh, important to understand them. Uh, and then the ISM exhibit a wide range of physical condition, wider than what is possible in the laboratory. So we find ISM in different temperatures and pressures. Uh, that's why ISM is an important laboratory for testing our understanding of astrophysics uh, at many levels. So we can call that ISM is a very rich laboratory that you can find very cold condition or very hot condition, very dense or uh, uh, very um, uh, diffuse. So I will talk a little bit about um, the discovery of ISM. So actually before 20th century, the Milky Way was thought to consist 
of stars in vacuum because we only see uh, the stars and the dark uh, background. But in 18th century, William, William Herschel was able to resolve some nebula using his telescope at the time. So at this time, we know that there, is, there are some extended luminous objects. And in, 90s, uh, in 1864, William Huggins used spectroscopy to, de to determine that nebula is made of gas. So you see here is um, a picture of a 2D uh, spectrum. Uh, this is emission spectrum. You see um, these bright lines. Uh, this is emission line uh, from the ISM. And then uh, important evidence came from photographic spectroscopy uh, of spectroscopy binary stars in the 20th century. This is by Johannes Hartmann. So Hartmann identified stationary lines of calcium two or calcium ionized uh, in the spectrum of spectroscopic binary star uh, Delta Orion is in 1904. So, uh, when you have a binary star, you know that the stars move around each other. So uh, in the spectrum, we will see the stellar lines uh, will uh, move uh, um, according to the system. But um, the ISM is not moving together with these binary stars so that it will uh, we will see it as a stationary lines in our spectrum. And then in 1930s, uh, uh, we have this discovery of Trumpler, Trumpler effect. So Trumpler study uh, open cluster and he found that the apparent diameter of Stark's clusters got smaller. So here is the plot from Trumpler. So in the ordinate, we have diameter distance. So this, uh, we, we obtain it by assuming that open cluster have the same physical diameter. And from this, we can compute this, uh, the distance. So this is diameter distance. And then uh, in the axis, we have photometric distance. Uh, we have it by assuming that open cluster have the same luminosity uh, and then we can compute this photometric distance. Uh, ideally, we, if there's no ISM, we have this straight line, but due to the ISM, we have this instead. So this is uh, one of the evidence that there are matters uh, between the stars in the galaxy and the matters uh, make the open cluster seems to be uh, smaller. Okay, now I will talk about um, the ISM composition. So as you know that um, in the universe, ISM contribute about 1% in the baryonic mass, but in our galaxy, uh, ISM mag, uh, makes up uh, between 10 to 15 percent of the baryonic matter in the galaxy in our Milky Way. And ISM consists of low density gas and dust. So I highlight the low density because it is very low compared to um, what we have uh, on Earth. So for example, the air on Earth um, in each uh, uh, cubic centimeter, uh, we have about uh, 10 to the power of 19 um, molecules or atoms, but in ISM, it is only like 0 0.1 uh, molecule or atom uh, in cubic centimeter. So you see that uh, we, are, we can say that it's almost vacuum. Well, it's not totally empty, but um, yeah, it's a very low density. So from... Um, for the composition, so from the ISM, about 99% is in the form of gas. So atom, ions, molecules is in the gas phase. And mostly we have uh, hydrogen, 
uh, and this hydrogen can be in the form of neutral hydrogen, molecule hydrogen, and also ionized hydrogen. And then we also have uh, helium and other atoms and molecules. Uh, I'll show you in here. So this is the most abundant element in the local ISM. So you see the most abundant is hydrogen, and then next is helium and other um, atoms. Um, so 99% is gas, interstellar gas, and the remaining about 1% is, is dust. So interstellar dust is small solid particles, so it's in a solid phase. Um, and unlike uh, the dust uh, that we found on Earth, uh, this dust is also very small, it's only like micron size. So it is, it, uh, but we will see later that uh, despite it is, it is only 1% uh, in our galaxy, uh, it is very essential to study dust because of the critical, um, because of the critical role in the matter cycle and evolution. Okay. Um, so this is illustration of interstellar dust. In the core, we have like silicate or carbon, uh, and usually surround the core, we have ice, mantle of ice. And then very interesting about interstellar dust is that in the surface, you may find molecules because uh, the grain uh, or dust, dust grain operate, operates as uh, a chemical factories that bring together atoms that might be rarely meet, or uh, in another word, it catalyzing uh, the chemical reaction. So, for example, you have here um, uh, interstellar dust or dust grain, and then you have um, atom that attach to the to the surface, and then another atom that attach to the surface, and then actually there. Uh, we can have this reaction uh, to form the H2 molecules. <clears throat> so another interesting about dust uh, is that, that this dust grain absorb um, ionizing UV radiation and it protects the molecules. So for example, we have UV radiation in here, uh, we have uh, H2 molecules in here, so if um, the molecules are not in the dust, you see that UV radiation can easily uh, destroy this molecule into atoms. But if the molecules is uh, in the surface of the dust, you see that it is quite safe from the UV radiation. And then another thing about dust grain is that it keeps um, the interstellar gas cloud cool by absorbing the energy from both gas grain collision and UV radiation. Uh, and then this uh, grain, uh, the heated grain, we emit in uh, energy in the infrared. So you have here a UV radiation uh, uh, absor absorbed uh, by the grain, and then it will heat the grain, and the grain will uh, re-emit um, the energy, mostly in uh, infrared region. Uh, with the current research, um, so before we talk about dust uh, is in micron size, but now we also find uh, dust down to nanometer size and several observation finding points to the existence of nanoparticles, nanodust, nanograins in the interstellar medium. So you see ISM is very rich, you can find um, uh, PAH, uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbon, uh, which is a, a large molecules, so, uh, and also uh, we find nano diamonds, and these are categorized also as uh, nano dust. And here there's also discovery uh, by this paper uh, that found uh, like nano diamond in the meteorites. Uh, so it seems that this um, nano uh, grain or nano particles common in our universe. 
so uh, I have mentioned to you that um, um, this uh, is only like 1% from the total mass uh, of baryonic matter in our galaxy. Uh, but despite only 1%, it has a very important effect to our uh, observation. So uh, we know that there is uh, interstellar extinction and reddening. So if a star, uh, starlight, traveling through ISM, um, so it will be dimmer and uh, reddened. So it the so the star looks different uh, from uh, than it did be, uh, when it ad emitted. Uh, so dust can absorb and scatter the light, and actually blue light uh, is uh, scattered or absorbed more than uh, red light. So that's why when the starlight pass through the ISM, so blue light scattered easily, and the, the light uh, that can pass is uh, the red one. Uh, so extinction, uh, there's actually caused by two processes, there's absorption and also scattering. This is the illustration, another illustration. So this is from the stars, a light from the stars, sorry, this is the dust cloud. Uh, and you see this um, uh, reflection uh, or scattering, uh, and then this is the transmission. So uh, the blue light is more uh, absorbed and scattered, while as the red light is easily transmitted. So that's why the astronomical object, the stars that we've seen uh, on Earth, uh, it appears redder. So when the dust absorbs the light, it will become warmer and it will emit thermal radiation uh, at near or far infrared. So we can see here, um, this is uh, emission map, uh, all sky survey uh, from Kobe. This is far infrared, about 60 to 240 micron uh, map of galaxy. See, so you see this is um, the distribution of the dust. And you see that most of the take place. But you can also see uh, uh, in high latitude. Uh, you can also find it in uh, another map. So now there's a lot of um, survey and uh, very uh, beautiful and detailed map. This is another example from IRS and Kobe. Uh, so this is the dust uh, column density map. So again, we see uh, dust is more concentrated in this galactic plane. So we, so I have mentioned before, there is a cycle of matter in the ISS, ISM. So from the uh, ISM, for example, this is uh, diffuse ISM, and then uh, in the uh, dense ISM or dense molecular cloud, uh, star are formed, and then the star will produce dust, okay? And then it also gives a uh, stellar wind uh, that also ejects some of the material. And then in the end of the evolution, it will explode or it will expel a large amount of uh, its atmosphere uh, or envelope uh, and become a uh, planetary nebula or supernova remnant. So the star will come back again to ISM. Uh, so it, it will enrich the ISM. And actually, uh, the ISM can escape to the intergalactic. So we see here with, with the galactic wind uh, process, we can also lose ISM in the galaxy, uh, but we can also get an, an infall uh, of uh, gas and dust uh, from the intergalactic uh, gas. So you see that there's gas that uh, escaped from the galaxy, but also there's gas that been captured by our galaxy. So 
So as I mentioned uh, in the previous picture that this is star produced uh, dust. So uh, interstellar dust is likely produced in the outer atmosphere of red giant because the temperature is uh, not so high and then the density is also uh, uh, quite high this, there. Uh, so this is a plot uh, spectrum flux uh, versus wavelength. Uh, uh, in, in the upper panel, you see the infrared spectrum uh, from the atmosphere of red giant star. And then uh, the, uh, the bottom panel uh, is laboratory spectrum of ISM. And you see similarity features uh, that we found in uh, red giant stars uh, atmosphere and in laboratory spectrum. We know that uh, in, the, in the atmosphere of red giant star, we see this uh, ISM. So ISM are found in a wide range of temperature and density. So the classical models classify the ISM into three main phases. So uh, the first one is the cold neutral medium, CNM, uh, often referred uh, to as cloud. Uh, and then we also have warm ionized medium and warm neutral medium, and also we have hot ionized medium, which is sometimes referred to as intercloud medium or coronal gas. So you can see the properties of this ISM phase here, CNM, uh, WNM, WEM, then uh, HIM, and this is uh, approximate uh, temperature of uh, this phase. And then this is a explanation about the heating process that happened and then the cooling mechanism and also how can we observe uh, this uh, ISM phase. For example, we have cold neutral uh, matter. So it, it, the heating mechanism is by photoelectron from dust, uh, ionization from starlight, uh, cosmic ray, and then the cooling uh, mechanism is we found it uh, by fine structure and line emission. So we can observe this uh, cold neutral matter in uh, H121 centimeter, so in radio, and also in optical and also UV absorption line. Whereas warm neutral medium, uh, we see that the heating mechanism by photoelectron from dust, ionization by starlight, cosmic ray, uh, pressure equilibrium, and then the cooling uh, mechanism is by optical line emission, fine structure line emission, and we can observe this warm neutral medium again in radio in H1 uh, hydrogen neutral 21 centimeter emission or absorption, uh, optical and also UV absorption line. In the case of uh, warm uh, interstellar matter, uh, so the heating is by photoelectron from hydrogen, helium, photoionized, uh, either by expanding or uh, in pressure equilibrium, and then the cooling, we can find it in optical line emission. So here you already see emission line, and then free free emission, fine structure line emission, and then we can observe this warm uh, in, uh, in interstellar matter uh, in optical line emission and also thermal radio continuum. Whereas for the hot uh, interstellar matter, uh, so the temperatures can reach a million Kelvin. Um, so the heating is by shock heated, collisional ionized, and either expanding or in pressure equilibrium. And then the cooling mechanism, we find it in adiabatic expansion and also X-ray emission. So we can see uh, the, this hot uh, interstellar matter uh, by observe UV and also X-ray emission. And also we see it in radio synchrotron, uh, synchrotron emission. So another way to classify the interstellar matter or interstellar cloud uh, is made uh, from here. Uh, uh, from Snow and McCall 2006. So here um, they uh, 
divide the cloud into dense molecular, translucent, uh, diffuse molecular, and diffuse atomic. Uh, and you can see the atom and molecules that are dominant in each phase. For example, in dense molecular, you see uh, more uh, hydrogen molecules, whereas in diffuse uh, met, uh, ISM, you see more hydrogen neutral. And then you can see that in dense molecular, you see more CO, whereas in translucent and diffuse molecular, you see the carbon uh, atoms and so on. But we have to keep in mind that ISM is complex in its structure. So we often uh, uh, think that uh, we have homogeneous cloud, but in reality, most real sideline uh, consists of a mixture of different type of clouds. So in our sideline, we see actually a different type of uh, uh, interstellar matter or interstellar cloud. So since ISM has um, uh, different temperatures and also pressure, so we also see different type of nebula. So when you have um, uh, here is a dark nebula uh, that obscured the star behind uh, the cloud. And if there is a hot star uh, in the ISM region where uh, the star emits UV radiation and it will hit the ISM, we will see uh, uh, the ISM will re-emit. And so we see uh, emission uh, nebula in here. And due to the scattering um, process uh, by the dust, we can also see reflection nebula in here. So this is an illustration. So we are here, the observer is here. We, we have hot star in here. So the ISM uh, that uh, is close to the star uh, will be emission nebula. Uh, and then, uh, if light scattered through a dusty cloud, uh, not along the line of sight, uh, it will uh, become bluer. So we see uh, that the color is blue in here for this reflection nebula. <clears throat> so in the ISM, uh, I've shown you before that there is material flow. So we can have infall from intergalactic medium. So this is uh, approximate amount of this um, infall from the intergalactic medium to the ISM. Uh, and in the ISM, you see there's star formation, but the stars also eject, uh, expel the materials to the ISM. Um, and the stars also become stellar remnant. Uh, whereas for the energy balance, you see uh, that the ISM uh, gets energy from the stars, from the starlight photons, from the stellar ejecta kinematic energy, also from extragalactic photons, and then it will lose the energy uh, with the radiative cooling. So about the hydrogen uh, natural 21 centimeter. Uh, so we already talked that dust can emit in infrared. So we can have this um, emission map um, in infrared uh, region. Uh, but for the gas, uh, we can study it uh, in radio domain uh, that is in 21 centimeter. And actually, most of our knowledge uh, of the distribution of natural atomic hydrogen in ISM uh, and also other uh, in our galaxy and other galaxy comes from uh, observation of the 21 centimeter line. So this line is actually arise from the transition between the hyperfine structure level in the ground state of hydrogen. So we have here um, uh, a hydrogen atom we see the spin uh, is uh, parallel, and then there is a time when the spin is flipped. Uh, so in this case, 
uh, the electron uh, when the, the spin of the electron flip the atom gain or lose uh, the energy so, so we will have absorption or emission uh, and we see it in the 21 centimeter so here is the map of h1 21 centimeter this is uh, like all sky survey by Ken Lockman this is the distribution of uh, atomic hydrogen in our galaxy. So again, similar to the dust map, uh, most of the gas is in uh, the galactic plane. But you see also gas in high latitude uh, galactic. So if we want to um, understand the structure of our galaxy, so from this 2D map, we can try to find the distance of each um, cloud in here. So the, uh, one of the way is by using the velocity curve. Uh, from the velocity of the cloud, we can reconstruct uh, the structure of our galaxy. Uh, so this is an illustration of the structure of our galaxy. We, uh, so we can um, uh, transform it uh, uh, into distance and so we know the distribution of the ism in the galaxies we see like spirals arm uh, uh, that show the structure uh, the structure of our galaxy <clears throat> um so we already talked about the neutral uh ISM and how about molecular clouds? Uh, can we detect them? Uh, yes. So molecular clouds are the densest region of interstellar space. Uh, they play important role in star formation. So star form uh, in uh, molecular clouds. Molecular clouds uh, are formed primarily, primarily of hydrogen. Uh, arranged in molecule consists of two atoms, so H2. But uh, unfortunately, uh, this H2 is very difficult to detect. They don't interact with light in the visible part of the spectrum. So we can say that they are invisible in optical telescope. So to observe this H2 cloud or molecular cloud, we must relate to other tracer uh, materials that uh, make up only small portion of a cloud, but easy to detect. So we found that the best tracer, uh, the, the best tracer for molecular clouds, turn on to be the molecules which live deep within them. So it is actually carbon monoxide or CO molecules. Uh, so we can detect it in, uh, I think, about 2.6 millimeter. So it's in radio. So the CO molecule can exist uh, in the dips inside densest cloud of hydrogen, so protected by outer layer of gas and dust. Uh, if we detect CO gas, which means uh, we can conclude that there is also molecular, molecular hydrogen surround, surrounding it. So this is a uh, CO map uh, in galactic coordinate. So we see again that most of the CO cloud uh, are, are distributed in the galactic plane. So this is the map from uh, down uh, at all 2001. Uh, so again, we have found similar, similarity uh, map as we found in emission map of dust and also uh, from hydrogen natural or 21 centimeter. Now I will explain uh, some of the basic no uh, notion. So we already talked that um, dust uh, can affect our observation. Uh, so there is what we call as interstellar extinction and interstellar reddening. So if this is the stars and this is the ISM and then we are here, the observer. So uh, if the stars uh, have uh, in certain uh, intensity or, or flux here, 
uh, so this is flux lambda zero is the flux uh, that have been observed without extinction. But if we observe here, uh, where we have obscuring cloud, uh, we have uh, observed uh, value of flux. Uh, so this is what we observe is um, the initial flux multiplied by a factor that is exponential minus tau, where tau is the optical depth. So uh, since there is this uh, uh, decrease in the flux, uh, it uh, we will also different. Uh, we will also see different magnitude. So, for example, the intrinsic magnitude and the apparent magnitude that we see will also be different. So here we have number of uh, magnitude of extinction, and this is the formula. So minus two point five log uh, the uh, observed flux and this initial flux. Uh, and from this equation, we can uh, change into this one. So if we uh, make it simple, we have this uh, value on about 1.086 uh, uh, optical depth. So we see that the change in magnitude due to extinction is approximately equal to the optical depth along the line of sight. And the optical depth actually proportional to the number of the particle uh, cross section and also um, uh, extinction uh, efficiency factor. So if we now have uh, from this, we have this uh, change in magnitude. Uh, if you remember the distant modulus equation, where you have apparent and absolute magnitude is uh, equal to five log distance minus five plus uh, uh, this A or the change of magnitude. So if we put this value, then we can get the distance uh, of the astronomical object of the star that we, we, uh, we study. Um, we can also make a plot between um, the dust extinction as a function of wavelength here. So this is A lambda divided by uh, A in a visual band. Uh, and we see that extinction is mostly in shorter wavelength in UV here. So it is high, uh, the extinction is higher in here uh, where it is lower in short, uh, in long wavelength. But you see in here, there is an interesting feature a bump over here. So this is um, what we call it, we call as extinction curve. Uh, and this bump is in about uh, 200, uh, sorry, 2175 Armstrong. Uh, and actually it is due to uh, molecules like, like polyaromatic hydrocarbons uh, that, uh, Scat, uh, scatter or absorb uh, more in this wavelength. It's more effective in this wavelength. We also have selective, selective extinction, what we call as selective, selective extinction. So um, we can define um, uh, color excess. That is the difference between measured color, so this is magnitude that we observe, apparent magnitude that it is observed in lambda one, and then this is the apparent magnitude that we observe in lambda two. So this is the difference of this magnitude is uh, what we call it as color or measured color. And then this one is uh, uh, again the same, uh, but this one is uh, the intrinsic, uh, if there's no uh, ISM uh, without uh, extinction. So we can re, um, uh, reformulate it into this uh, color. Uh, so 
EB fear color excess is measured color minus observed color, or if we have uh, observation in two uh, wavelength in blue and uh, optical, blue and V of visual, so uh, excess color EB minus V is actually uh, color B minus V uh, minus uh, B minus V intrinsic. Or in the other word, we can say this is the extinction in blue uh, minus extinction in visual. Mm. Okay. We also know um, about uh, total extinction. So before we have selective extinction, now we have uh, this is R uh, equal to AV divided by uh, EB minus V. This is ratio of total to selective extinction. And the R value uh, for our Milky Way, uh, usually we use 3.1, uh, uh, but it can vary because the value of uh, this ratio, uh, it depends on dust properties um, and it's determined by observation, which is turn used to constrain the dust model. So in uh, denser, uh, in denser cloud, we can have higher value of error. It can reach five or four uh, for the value of the ratio of total to selective extinction. So, um, here I show you again extinction curve. So in the previous plot, we have lambda, but this is uh, one per lambda. So it, it is flipped from the previous plot that I show you. And this is still the extinction in certain wavelength divided by the normalized uh, extinction. Uh, you see that uh, extinction is higher in shorter wavelength, uh, but you see there is a certain uh, region where uh, suddenly the extinction is higher. For example, is uh, in in this UV bomb, uh, it is caused by uh, graphite or polyaromatic hydrocarbon. And in uh, in about infrared here, 9.7 micron, you also have a little bump that's due to the silicate. Uh, and you see different um, uh, dust properties show different uh, extinction car curve. For example, for R uh, equal to five, uh, the ratio of total to selective extinction five, you, you have this, and then uh, if it is smaller, you have uh, this curve. So we have dust and we have gas, and actually we can correlate between the gas and dust. We know that the gas and dust are well mixed uh, in general, uh, but we can also study the correlation between them. So this is plot um, between the, uh, this is the reddening, so this is caused by dust. And then this is the total uh, uh, of hydrogen, natural hydrogen. Uh, so we see that uh, uh, it's quite, uh, the correlation is uh, uh, quite good um, and we can uh, then uh, determine that um, for, uh, so this is the total uh, column of hydrogen, it is uh, 5.8 multiplied 10 uh, to the power of 20. Uh, uh, centimeter minus two, magnitude minus one. So for uh, each uh, magnitude, uh, one magnitude, we have this uh, total column of the hydrogen. And we can also relate to this formula. We remember that um, uh, this ratio of total to selective extinction. So we know that this is uh, the relation between uh, uh, N and A, so we can uh, we can uh, also change it into this formula, and then as we know that uh, extinction is um, you can 
derived from this formula. So we can also uh, derive it and we can find this uh, dust to gas ratio. Okay, um, now I will talk about um, how study ISM by using spectroscopic data. Uh, so we see that um, uh, dust can uh, emit, um, so we see, we study it usually in photometry, but um, for the gas, uh, we usually study in spectroscopy. So spectroscopy is one of the most powerful tools for studying the ISM. Uh, because in ISM, uh, we can get a lot of information, we can get composition. So for example, you have a stack spectrum and you have a series of uh, absorption line or emission line from this series of absorption or emission, we can determine um, which uh, atoms or molecules responsible to this absorption or emission. So we know the composition of the ISM. We also can determine the kinematics. Um, uh, so, so this is the very famous uh, Doppler, uh, spectroscopy Doppler shift. So delta lambda divided by uh, lambda in rest in the rest wavelength uh, equal to uh, radial velocity divided by speed. So for example, we know that uh, certain atoms have certain rest wavelength and then we observe uh, this line in, uh, for example, lambda. So we can measure the lambda divided by lambda zero uh, equal to VR, uh, right, uh, the radial velocity divided by speed, so we can determine the radial uh, uh, velocity of this ISM, whether it is moving toward us, uh, so it will be like blue shift, or it will be uh, award, uh, or escaping from us, so it will be red shifted. So from spectroscopy, we get the kinematics, um, and this is also important. Uh, for example, when I show you the map of uh, emission uh, emission map, and then if we want to know the distance from the uh, rotation curve, we can uh, get uh, or reconstruction uh, the distance. And then uh, we can also get information about abundance, temperature, pressure, magnetic field, uh, and so on. So for the um, so maybe you already know about it. This, this is the Kirchhoff law of spectroscopy. So if we have a hot source, we have this continuous spectrum. And if there is cool gas, we get a continuous spectrum, but we also have these absorption features. Uh, and for the hot gas, we have emission spectrum. And in the case of stars, uh, we know stars is black body, but stars also have atmospheres, a tiny layer uh, surrounded it. So uh, the stellar spectrum is uh, actually absorption spectrum. So you have this continuous and also absorption features that is come from the stellar itself. So we, we call it stellar lines. So in case there's uh, interstellar matter or non-stellar absorption features, uh, we can get, we can see more absorption lines. Uh, so this is the illustration. So if we have star here. Um, so we observe just uh, here after the star, we get uh, this spectrum. So this is the absorption spectrum, but you see this is the, the, the black or this absorption uh, dark line, absorption line uh, is uh, caused by uh, the gas uh, uh, around the star, so stellar atmosphere. So this, we call it stellar lines. But if there is ISM or interstellar cloud and we observe in here, we see this broad absorption line from stellar line, but you see also narrow absorption uh, due to the cloud. And if we observe here, we get more narrow absorption lines. So you see um, uh, in, if there's ISM, you will get extra narrow absorption line that are added to the stellar spectrum. So, uh, so this is a spectrum in 2D. So for example, I plot in 1D, so intensity uh, 
uh, as a function of frequency. Uh, so usually stellar line um, are broader than interstellar line because star uh, are hot hotter than uh, interstellar matter. Interstellar matter usually uh, uh, cold. Well, it's different. Um, there are many phases, but uh, usually we have uh, cold or neutral uh, cloud. So you see that the absorption is usually narrow than the stellar line. So this is an illustration. So we have this is a spectrum of a hot star or early type star. So this is intensity in a function of wavelength. Uh, you see absorption here uh, due to stellar atmosphere, or we, we call it stellar line. And this is the continuum of the spectrum. So if we zoom a um, region here, uh, so if we zoom this plot into a really um, narrow region, this is uh, from 5894 Armstrong to 5899 Armstrong, you see a broad stellar line because the stars is here is quite hot and it is also a fast rotator. So that's why the, the shape or the profile of the line is very broad. And then in addition, because of the interstellar cloud or interstellar matter, you see absorption uh, line, which is narrow because this is a cold uh, interstellar matter. And what we can do is we can measure this line to determine the abundance of the ISM. So this is another illustration um, where you have a narrow, re a narrow spectrum here from 5880 Armstrong to 5905 Armstrong. This is intensity in a function of wavelength. So the black is the spectrum. Uh, so this is lead type spectrum. So this is cool star. And in this case, it is more difficult to distinguish between a stellar and interstellar line because the line, for, uh, the stellar line of the letter type spec uh, spectrum or this cool star is actually as narrow as interstellar line. So in this case, uh, to study the ISM, we usually use what we call as a stellar model. So this is a stellar synthetic model uh, that we can calculate or modeling. So we know which one. So this is the, the dot, the, uh, the red dot is the, the model that we get, uh, we get for the stellar line. Uh, so from this, we know that the line here and line here, so this is actually sodium doublet, uh, is actually not from the star, but it is from interstellar. So this is the, the purple here is the model of um, uh, interstellar line. And uh, by uh, profile fitting, we can measure this line and then we can determine the uh, properties of the ISM, not only the abundance, you can get the temperature uh, and so on. <clears throat> so uh, I mentioned before, we can measure this um, line. Uh, for example, if we have this uh, absorption line, we can measure this line uh, by measuring what we call as equivalent width. So equivalent width is the width of rectangle below the normalized spectrum having the same area as the surface comprised uh, between the line profile and the continuum. So this area is actually equal to this area. And then this is what we call as equivalent width. And this is the formula of the equivalent width. Uh, so this is defined as integral of uh, 1 minus uh, f uh, the flux here uh, divided by the flux in the continuum and uh, multiplied by the delta frequency or we can also change it the, to here uh, we can also uh, we know that tau uh, the optical de depth uh, proportional to the density cross-section and also uh, efficiency uh, extension efficiency factor. So we can also reformulate it the equivalent with here. So we know there is a relationship between the equivalent width and the abundance 
the number of particles or atoms or molecules that uh, that is in the ISM. Excuse me. Uh, yeah. Yes. Five minutes before we have a question and answer. Oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. I will. I will finish uh, this part. Um, so. Uh, um, so we know uh, we also have what we call as curve of growth. So this is the equivalent width, and then this is the n, um, the number of particle. And you see there is three uh, uh, three region. So this is the linear region, saturated region, and then this is damp region. So in this case, in the linear region, if we measure uh, equivalent width, we can derive uh, the total uh, the abundance of um, the atoms or molecules in the ISM. Um, but if uh, we are in this region, uh, we have to be careful because our measurement may be inaccurate. So this is illustration of a spectrum. This is the linear part where, where we see the profile is okay, but when it is saturated, you see that the, the absorption reach zero here. And in damp saturated, we see zero, and then this uh, there's this damp wing, uh, and then in this region, in this region, we have to be careful because um, the equivalent width that we uh, the equivalent width that we measured uh, will no longer proportional to uh, the abundance of the the ISM that we measured. Um, so uh, before I uh, um, I explain about the uh, spectroscopy, uh, mostly absorption, but we can also study um, spectroscopy from emission spectrum. Um, that usually, uh, this is for molecules, the emission of molecules that we find in uh, infrared and also in radio. Um, okay. Um, so actually, I want to talk a little bit about diffuse interstellar band. Uh, but um, Mr. Kunjai, do you think I still have time, or we should just finish now? Two or three minutes is okay. Okay. Well, I will just talk a bit. What we um, so this is actually um, uh, one of my, the topics uh, of my research. Uh, so the diffuse here is not because it is in uh, diffuse interstellar matter phase, but it is because it is broad. So actually in the stellar spectrum, we detect large set of weak absorption features that are found in a spectra of red and star. And when I say large set, it's actually it's about um, 500 uh, absorption. Um, uh, and interestingly, we don't really know what caused this absorption. Um, except for the two uh, band or two line uh, in infrared that we know is caused by uh, C60 plus. So it's kind of like a polyaromatic hydrocarbon fullerence. But there are 100 other absorption and we still not yet uh, know uh, what caused them. So this is a mystery in, spectroscop uh, in astronomical spectroscopy. So this is, um, for example, so this is if I plot all the uh, diffuse interstellar band, there's hundred of them. So for example, you only have spectrograph in this area, and what it when what can you do with the spectrum? Uh, actually, you can try to find diffuse interstellar band in there, but diffuse interstellar band is very weak. So if you see, this is normalized spectrum, and you see that it's very weak. And it is confusing because the profile, you see substructure in the profile. Uh, so from this 500 absorption, two of them is here. We know now is it is from C60 plus. And this is a comparison if we have uh, the classical uh, atomic uh, line, uh, interstellar line uh, compared to deep. So we see deep is very weak uh, and broad, but um, so this is the properties of the dip. There's about 500 dips, uh, very weak, um, very broad. 
So the word diffuse, interstellar band diffuse means because it is broad. The width is about 0.5 Armstrong to 30 Armstrong. And then it has substrate. Uh, and then uh, most deep are not strongly correlated with each other. So uh, this tells us that it has multiple carriers. So it's not only uh, caused by uh, one molecule or it, it's probably uh, complex uh, different molecules and then interestingly it has correlated with interstellar extinction so despite we don't know um, uh, the nature of diffuse interstellar band we can still use it um, as interstellar tracer because they are numerous uh, in our spectrum so there's 500 in optical and infrared region it is not easily saturated because it is weak so we are st still in the linear area of curve of growth uh, and then it is, has correlation with extinction, so it, we can use it to also um, uh, predict or um, compare with the uh, emission from the dust. And actually, there is a effort to build a 3D ISM map where you have here um, interstellar. So this is uh, this map is um, so if we slice our galaxy so the distribution of the galactic plane this is to the so galactic center is in that that direction this is the uh, 90 degree minus 180 and then this 270 degree uh, so our sun is still is here and you see this mm, uh, low density area surrounded by these interstellar clouds um, Okay, I think um, I will talk until yeah. uh, I will stop here, Mr. Kunjai. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Puspitarini. Uh, then I will open for question. There is several questions uh, here. Uh, are the first will be from Fernanda Putra. Uh, his question is similar to Su Chu uh, from uh, uh, China. So, uh, Please, um, Mr. Fernanda Putra, uh, you can ask your questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kunjaya, for the opportunity. Uh, actually, I think my first question has been answered, uh, but maybe I'll just write, uh, ask it right away. Um, so, um, uh, how to distinguish the light emitted from the stars uh, and the light emitted from the ISM due to scattering. Since um, I think the light scattered by ISM are from more than one stars. And my, uh, yeah, does it affect the measurement somehow? Um, and my second question is, is the distribution of ISM affected by dark matter? Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you very much, Fernanda. So, um, yeah, we can distinguish uh, the light um, from the stars and also from the ISM, but we need we need multi. I think the one of the solution is we have multi wavelength observation. Yeah, we will be really clear. For example, if we only see in infrared, um, and we all see uh, we see emission map. It is difficult when we only have one wavelength uh, to distinguish which one is from the stars, for example, cool star, and then from ISM. But if we have observation from different wavelengths, we know which one is stars and which one is uh, ISM. So we because we all we know the spectral and the distribution. So yeah, I think one of the solution is we have this multi wavelength observation. Okay. Uh, and then for the distribution of ISM, is it affected by dark matter? Hmm. Uh, yeah, well, dark matter doesn't interact with light, so we don't really know. Um, but it creates potential. Um, so yeah, it built a structure in the universe, or the dark matter built structure in the universe. Uh, but if we talk about a local ISM, maybe the dark matter is not really, you know, um, dominant. I mean, uh, 
um, compared to if we are talking about this galaxy or universe scale. So I think it's, it, it probably affects um, its potential, uh, graf gravitational potential. But um, uh, yeah, I don't think there's more interaction uh, to the ISM. That's why we, until now, we, we still ha uh, difficult to detect dark matter, right? <laughs> Oh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Fernanda. So the uh, second question is from uh, Ilhan Prasetyo from Indonesia. Uh, Mr. Ilhan Prasetyo, please. Uh, okay, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, first question is, how can you distinguish experimentally between each ISM phases? And the second is, is the colorful photos of galaxies that uh, we uh, uh, frequently uh, see in uh, such uh, documentaries are only due to the diffuse matter or there are other uh, causes. Okay. Um, sorry. Uh, okay. Oh, what is the second question? Uh, 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 is the, is colorful the colorful photos? photos colorful is the photos? colorful photos uh, uh, due to the dis diffuse matter only or there are other causes? Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so for the first question, it's about extra experimentally. So yeah, well, it's not really my expert uh, expertise, but um, yeah, it's very interesting because um, we try to uh, like simulate um, or um, trying to approach the condition um, in space uh, on the laboratory on Earth. Um, okay. Yes, you you uh, there are several experiments. So, uh, for example, usually you have like laser. Uh, well, when I did my master degree, I did my internship uh, in a laboratory uh, uh, called LAMOS in France. So, actually, this is uh, this uh, atmosphere and also uh, astrophysical laboratory. And uh, I see that in the experiment, they use like laser and then change it to the different energy level and then see what happens, what's going on with the matter when it's interact with the, um, this uh, light. So uh, actually in the, in the experiment laboratory, we try to understand the interaction between the light and matter so that we can explain what happened in uh, interstellar matter. Uh, and then the second question about this colorful image of the ISM. So actually the colorful image um, uh, it's come from the um, uh, the band that we used uh, to observe uh, the object. Uh, for example, if I use um, like RGB or Strongen or so there's different uh, photometric system. Uh, so that's why we produce this color. Sometimes the color is not real uh, because, for example, in the infrared region, uh, we don't know what is the color of ER and so on. So um, uh, but there's also in, in, in optical, for example, if you see like green uh, colors, it, it may uh, con uh, correspond to the ionized oxygen uh, and so on. So uh, it can be real and it can also be like fake color. Is it what yeah. your question is? Okay. Yeah, thank okay. you. Uh, thank the, you. the question is from Kla Miat Tanda from uh, Myanmar. Uh, please, Mr. Uh, uh, Miatandar. Uh, please uh, switch on your mic. Okay. Hello, Professor. I would like to know about the difference between dark matter and diffuse matter. Okay. Um, so, dark matter, um, well, there is a broad definition of dark matter, uh, like baryonic and non-baryonic dark matter. But in this lecture, series of lecture, we will talk about this non-baryonic dark matter. That is the baryonic that doesn't interact um, with the light. So we cannot see it, but there's also, uh, so the diffuse matter that I talk is baryonic matter, gas and dust. Whereas the dark matter that we discuss is the non-baryonic, it can be like particle, um, uh, like like um, uh, yeah, like particle, like neutrinos or some kind of like particles. Uh, it can be a lot of things uh, for the this 
uh, uh, non baryonic dark matter okay. okay thank you uh, the fourth question is from suruchi sahi from nepal uh, please uh, say your question thank you for the opportunity uh, you mentioned about interstellar reddening in your presentation and mm -hmm. i am curious about that uh, how do scientists distinguish between interstellar reddening and actual red shift of a particular star since uh, it uh, is uh, both are very different uh, phenomenon yeah yeah okay thank you very much so uh, interstellar reddening we see in different color so um, you remember that i mentioned uh, uh, color axis so uh, the reddening uh, we can uh, know from the different color change of uh, color uh, whereas a redshift um, we can find uh, so the redshift um, for example line is shifted uh, to the uh, longer wavelength so it is redshifted but in the case of when we talk about our galaxy um, well, if we measure redshift using the formula uh, that we use redshift for the galaxy, then it's very small. So that's why uh, we don't really talk redshift in uh, for when we talk our galaxy. Usually, we use redshift when we use larger scale, like universe scale, like other galaxies and so on. But for um, like the reddening uh, is it in the in the galaxy? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Answer. Uh, the next is uh, from uh, Vanessa. Ms. Vanessa, uh, please. Okay. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, talking about the origin of diffuse matter, uh, you said that diffuse matter comes from primordial material and recycled material. And my question is, how can we separate or know whether it comes from primordial materials or recycled materials? Is there any feature that unique so we can uh, separate it? Or... Okay. Hmm. Um, yeah. So for the primordial material, we know uh, the hydrogen and helium. Yeah. Uh, it's formed since the big uh, after the Big Bang. Um, uh, so how we differentiate, how we distinguish between the primordial and the uh, recycle. So when we see um, material that is in higher element, like heavy heavy elements, right? heavy element, uh, we know that it is recycled because it is not made uh, due to the Big Bang. Um, for example, if we see iron, we know it is uh, from recycled material. So I think one of the ways to um, separate it is when we see um, the type of uh, element itself, whether it is the simple one or the complex one. The, the complex one is made uh, by this recycle process. Is it helping, Fanisha? Uh, for the hydrogen, yeah. uh, for the hydrogen, hmm, um, um, I don't really know the answer. Uh, but so, for the for the hydrogen for our galaxy, um, uh, yeah, it's it's combination between what present before and what um, uh, rec uh recycle uh matter. Uh, but I think, um, yeah, um, because we, when we see hydrogen, it's probably before it was molecules, uh, hydrogen, and then destroyed by the UV. So it's really hard to uh, separate which hydrogen is from uh, primordial, from the Big Bang, and then uh, from the... Um, uh, what we call it from the recycle of material okay. but for other element it is easier we know okay thank you thank you, thank you. uh the next question from Chu Tzu, uh from china please okay okay i'm here can you hear me yes, yes, yes. hear you uh, yes uh, that's cool uh thanks for the marvelous uh, presentation or lectures uh that walk me through the whole uh, whole <laughs> world of eyes and, yes and uh, <laughs> uh, my question is uh, how do we distinguish which is from uh, just uh, uh, the, 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 the absorption lines 
which is from the stars, uh, uh, star atmosphere, and which is from cloud one, cloud two, okay. and so on. Yeah. Uh, uh, since uh, that's my question. Okay. Um, so, uh, so before I show you the plot where you have stellar line, but also uh, interstellar line. So the stellar line, um, we know, we we know, we can differentiate it by this velocity because all the stellar line will move together because there's a lot of lines, right? From yeah. hydrogen, from iron, from nitrogen, everything in the stars, and they are moved together with the stars. I mean, if the star moving toward us, all the lines will move uh, to the blue, right? Uh, yes. So. Uh, you can you can differentiate it uh, from the kinematics um, of the uh, uh, of the line. Oh, yeah. oh I, th I think my, my question is the case uh, that uh, uh, when you say a star is like a black body, the, mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, it means uh, continuous night, continuous uh, spectrum uh, to the universe. And the, the uh, and when the continuous uh, night uh, goes through the atmosphere of the stars and uh, uh, walk through the uh, cloud one, cloud two, and so on, and it will absorb some uh, some some special lines. Uh, yeah. So how to dis uh, how to distinguish this? Uh, for simple, <laughs> we just got a. Uh, <laughs> So we can't we, we can't do experiment or observation uh, between the cloud with the stars. Uh, so okay, so we can we can distinguish it actually. So from the spectrum that we observe, um, we we can distinguish which one is from the stellar atmosphere and which uh, one is from the interstellar. So there are several uh, way to do that. First, we see the profile the shape of the line. If it is broad, strong, it's likely from the stars. But it, okay. if, if it is narrow, it's come from the, the cloud. And then we can see these broad lines. They are, when the is moving, they move together. So um, we can, we, we, we can know what, uh, which lines are from the stars because of the kinematics, whereas interstellar line relatively uh, stationary because it doesn't move with the stars. So it, it has different velocities. So if we calculate the Doppler uh, spectroscopy do Doppler shift, they have different. This line have different uh, velocity. For example, if we have sodium that is come from stellar atmosphere and also sodium which come from the interstellar line it will have different velocity. So we can distinguish which one is from the stars by, for example, we, uh, we look at the hydrogen absorption that caused by the stellar line, we measure the velocity. So we know that the sodium, uh, in, uh, the stellar sodium line should be in this uh, uh, um, velocity. So the other line that is, uh, so the sodium lines that is not in that velocity, we know it's from interstellar clouds. Okay, thank you. Uh, I see. Thank you. Answer. But maybe uh, I can add something. That if you are quite fortunate uh, when you take a spectrum of a star, maybe uh, in your spectrum you can record the forbidden lines. Forbidden lines can uh, be produced only in interstellar medium. Yeah, but if your spectrum uh, do not include uh, forbidden lines, uh, you cannot do anything. Thank yeah. <laughs> okay, the last question. <laughs> okay, thank you. The last question is uh, from Mrula, Mrunalini. Mrunalini from India. Okay, <laughs> please. Am I audible? Hello. Hello, am I audible? Yeah, I hear you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, when we, observe, uh, when we observe a star within our uh, galaxy, we need to correct uh, its values for uh, our, uh, the properties of our local uh, ISM, uh, the extinction and reddening and all. What if we observe uh, a star uh, from an extra galactic uh, object? 
Okay, if we have an uh, observe uh, a star from other galaxy, we need to correct uh, its reddening and absorption not only for our local ISM but also for the ISM of that galaxy, right? So, do we have any models or how do we actually get the properties of the ISM in the other galaxy uh, to correct the values for that star, for the extra galaxy? Uh, for okay. the extra galactic, yes. Uh, yeah, for right. the extra galactic observation, we have to correct not only from the, uh, no, no, the effect from our, our galaxy or the ISM in our galaxy, uh, uh, then after that we can uh, get uh, the ISM of the galaxy. Uh, there's uh, uh, so there's uh, now nowadays uh, maybe you heard about um, uh, the inter integral field unit spectroscopy. Uh, is a very um, uh, advanced tool to study this um, ISM in the other galaxy. Uh, well, we, we know this ISM in other galaxy because uh, of the redshift, because it's very different from our galaxy. It is very redshift uh, according to uh, the galaxy itself. Uh, and uh, with the IFE or integral with spectroscopy, you can study um, how uh, this ISM uh, moving, um, or for example, uh, the, we can calculate the abundance and also the kinematics of the, this uh, extragalactic ISM. Is that your question? Okay, yeah. thank yeah. you. Yes. Thank you. So much. we have to uh, study through integral spectroscopy. Uh, we have to, we can study the properties of other uh, interstellar matter of the galaxy using integral yeah. field spectroscopy. Yeah. Yes, we can okay. we can determine the mass of the galaxy um, from the the kinematics. We can we we can determine the mass and the dust in the galaxy. Okay, thank you very okay. much uh, for Dr. Kuspitarini. Uh, it's a nice presentation, and uh, all of the question already answered, uh, and we already late for three minutes for our, from our schedule. I'm, sorry. I'm very sorry, Dr. <laughs> Kinjaya. <laughs> uh, uh, it means uh, uh, you give a good lectures so that many people interested in your lecture. Yeah, yeah, I hope it is useful. Okay, thank you everybody thank you. for attending this lecture. So uh, thank you, Dr. Kuspitarini. Thank uh, you. And uh, we will meet in the uh, other uh, lecture. Thank you very, very much and good afternoon in Indonesia. Okay, thank you.